Hi guys, welcome to part two at our look inside the cell. We have to remember that cells not only are small, but they absolutely have to be small. This comes down to their ability to be able to function at the speed that they need to, given that there are things that just have to happen so fast. So bear with me here. Have you ever seen the movie The Blob? This was a movie back in the 50s. It was a horror film, and it was basically a story about this goo from outer space that landed and began to expand, and it expanded, and it expanded from this minute, tiny little amount uh, to being so huge that it was actually devouring, like, the entire town, and so it would basically, like, you know, cover and digest people. It would get crazy. It would get crazier and insane the the bigger it got. From a living organism's perspective, this is completely just ridiculous because we have this little thing called the surface area to volume ratio and that would make something like the blob completely non-functional because to be that big it would not be able to do what it needs to do. Surface area to volume ratio, just to bring into it, um, we are gonna do an awesome lab called Cell Size and Diffusion. We're gonna be doing this coming up pretty darn soon. And this lab will actually explore this idea of why cells need to be so small. So just to remind us, surface area, the area of the object, um, all of its covering, okay? So the total sum area of its covering. So if I look at a cube, let's say, a cube is going to be length times width, and then the surface area, we have to include all surfaces, so that would be times six. So if I had my cube here, just to make the math nice and easy, right? There's my cube, length times width times the six surfaces that it has. Whereas volume, of that same cube is length times width times height, okay? And that's gonna tell me how much space it actually occupies. And we're gonna do work with this in class, so needless to say, I'm not gonna spend too much time with it here. Volume, when we talk about volume increases, it increases when we talk about per cubic amount, okay? So as the diameter increases by cube, we're basically talking about we're basically talking about volume increases or the amount of space that it takes up whereas surface area is with the square of the diameter okay so they are not increasing at the same rate and as something gets larger that ratio that comparison of the surface area to the volume actually decreases and goes down and what a cell wants to have is a really 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 high surface area to volume ratio so that it can move things through it and accomplish uh, the activities that it needs to do uh, much quicker complete it much quicker this is heavily diffusion related we are going to be to be working a ton with this idea and this process of diffusion, which is basically the movement of materials from an area of where it's really highly concentrated to where it's very low concentration. Controlling of the cell. It is controlled in a eukaryotic cell by the nucleus. This is a membrane-bound structure. It's just basically a membrane-bound vesicle. It has a lipid bilayer that it's made of. It's porous, so it's gonna have little holes, almost like pecked throughout and it's filled with DNA. Okay, this is where the DNA lives in a eukaryotic cell. And it stays within there, so for eukaryotes, we house the DNA completely separate from any of the other cell structures uh, versus a prokaryote where they have the DNA kind of just floating around. From here, we're gonna get into a little bit more of the complex organelles, and this is just to give you an overview. I wanna stress that you are gonna use your cell matrix as being basically your chart uh, to understand and um, have sort of your organized idea of eukaryotic cell structures and what their function is and their structure. So here's one just to give you a, a little insight into some of the more complicated ones. First and foremost is the mitochondria. Again, these are eukaryotic organelles. Okay, so these are not found in bacteria cells at all. The mitochondria's sole purpose is for ATP formation. ATP 
adenosine triphosphate. Uh, it's a nucleic acid derivative, and this is the molecule that we use as our energy cache. This is a big deal. Our entirety of the next unit is going to be focused around ATP, so energy Basically, yeah, I'm going to call it the energy cache. Um, it's what we use as sort of like our little dole out of energy. So the mitochondria is double membraned. Um, it basically has this outer layer okay, that I can draw in here. Okay, this is a transmission micrograph, um, and it's showing me really, really detailed electron micros using an electron microscope. And you can see that outer layer. It has all of these folds double membrane bound folds all through the inside that you can see here that I won't go you know totally over and it's primarily responsible for cellular respiration it's oxygen dependent this does not function um, and it won't work to build up ATP without oxygen the gradients of hydrogen ions are going to form here and the driving force behind this ATP formation is going to be these. And by gradient, I just mean um, differences on one side of the membrane to the other. These gradients are going to be critical to the formation of ATP. Again, this is just, hey, uh, just to let you know about it, we're going to come back to this next unit in complete detail. One of our understandings on eukaryotic uh, formation in the grand scheme of evolutionary timeline is in the sense of what we call the endosymbiotic theory. This theory was developed by a scientist by the name of Lynn Margulies, very cool lady. She um, is a professor down at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in the 70s. She did a lot of work with uh, eukaryotic cells and she is the first to give us this endosymbiotic theory saying that um, eukaryotic cells arose from two prokaryotic cells coming together, one engulfed another, they became so dependent on each other that they could no longer function without. So they started working together in this, what we call symbiotic relationship where they no longer could live literally without the other one. And this was the beginnings of eukaryotic cells. We have a lot of evidence supporting this. Eukaryotic cells generally are much bigger than prokaryotic cells. It was found that mitochondria and chloroplasts both contain their own DNA uh, and subsequent other structures that are reminiscent of former prokaryotic or bacteria cells. And so there's there's some some weight behind this that eukaryotic cells with the development of uh, two prokaryotic cells, two or more, working together um, for basically to survive. So again, that symbiotic theory is very supported by this fact. And mitochondrial DNA is actually structured as plasmid, just like bacterial DNA is, as the circular piece of DNA. Very cool because we can trace maternal, so mom to kid lineages based on mitochondrial DNA sequencing because all of your mitochondria came from your mom. So you can thank your mom for all of your cell organelles because dad's contribution was purely genetic. It was DNA only. So all of your cellular structures first came from mom's egg cell. And that means all of her uh, mitochondria is now your mitochondria and you share that DNA together. Function of mitochondria. Function of mitochondria is really important. 95% of our energy release from glucose happens here. So what happens in a quick overview, glucose initially out here in the cytoplasm, products of that breakdown head into here where we end up having what we call the Krebs cycle and that goes on in here and uh, basically helps us in the with oxygen produce mucho ATP molecules. Chloroplasts are found in plant cells and other photosynthetic organisms. They are there for the production of ATP. So there is ATP production from photosynthesis but its big deal is to produce organic molecules. Namely, the big one being glucose is produced through photosynthesis. So here's a chloroplast. In similarities to mitochondria, it's surrounded by a membrane 
there's many membranous folds on the inside, although it's a little bit different structure-wise. We have two outer membranes, inner membrane system, and you can see kind of very similarly to new mitochondria, uh, you've got these inner foldings, although we call these, you'll see here, these are called uh, thylakoid membranes right here. The inner membranes of a chloroplast are studded with chlorophylls, and that is the pigment uh, that is really responsible for the flow of electrons that occurs during photosynthesis to help put glucose molecules together. Carotenoids are another pigment. Uh, they uh, reflect a different wavelength of light, and it happens to be orange, so that's why like, carrots are orange. Uh, they're full of carotenoids. There is proton gradient formation here as well. We basically need to travel through electron transport um, many, many electrons to slow the release of energy to be able to utilize for the building purposes. And here we're talking about a synthesis reaction we're going to build up in photosynthesis, whereas in cell respiration we're going to break it down. Okay, but gradient formation is critical in both of these. And chloroplasts are a major piece of evidence in the endosymbiotic theory because they too contain their own DNA and that lends itself again to that idea that eukaryotic cells were the result of two prokaryotic, well, two or more prokaryotic cells getting together. So to end today we're going to wrap things up with the overall key concept of what this first half of the unit really covers and that is hey cells are the basic units of structure and function of living things that's really the big understanding so far we haven't found anything that seems to go against that if it qualifies as life it fits the fact that it's contained um, and it contains cells However, I want to throw this at you as a little as a little food for thought. Uh, what about viruses and prions? What do you think their role is in this? Are they living? Um, so viruses, you know, not for nothing, they're a protein coat with either DNA or RNA inside. When they infect a cell, they inject the genetic material into the cell, shed the protein coat, the DNA becomes incorporated into the cell that it's infected and become and basically transfers that cell over into a virus making factory. Is it alive? Prions, as you guys know right now, are rogue proteins. They are, you know, basically very, very highly stable proteins that can alter the shape of other proteins and thus replicate. Alive? Not alive? not made of cells so you know who knows but they definitely you know throw a little wrench in our thinking but in all of this I want you guys to bear in mind that your knowledge of eukaryotic cell structures are going to come with the knowledge learned from your cell matrix this is where you're gonna go to for all of your information um, on eukaryotic cell structures and utilize that as part of your notes. So between these vodcasts, between the information in chapter four and your cell matrix, you are going to be right on with basic ideas of cell structure because from here on out we're moving to function and that's where things get really cool. So take it easy and we'll catch you guys later.